We're going to start with Ward 6, Poll Workers Needed, Amy Bolvey, Assistant City Clerk. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Amy Bovey, I'm the Assistant City Clerk for the City of Burlington. Um, one of my jobs with the city is to prepare for elections, um, and as I'm sure you all know, we have one coming up on March 3rd, which will be our presidential primary as well as our annual city election. Um, so I came here tonight um, just seeking folks to help work at the polls on election day. Um, the city relies on volunteers from the community to run each of our eight polling places. Um, we do offer a payment for your work. Um, it's ten ninety six an hour, um, and there's a variety of shifts available, um, set up the night before and from early morning into the evening hours uh, on election day itself. A uh, number of tasks, um, checking voters in, helping calculate results, set up, break down all, all of the things that need to get done to make an election happen. Um, so I do have a sign-up sheet that I'll be passing around um, if folks are interested. Um, and I'm also available to answer any questions that anyone might have. I'm Rob, I'm Rob Packus, and I want to add to that pinch. I'm an inspector of elections. At Michelle is also one. As of March 3rd, I'll be the last elected, the only elected inspector of elections. We need three of them, and we need a ward clerk. So we really need some people to step up. And you can actually run as a write-in and get elected. Right? <laughs> because it, it happens regularly with this office. So if, if you are at all interested, good. you can contact me through the shell, or you can contact me too. Like, how would, would it work to just do a little write campaign? If you don't want to do that, please, someone, contact Amy, someone will contact you about helping the people. We really need it. We've always had a good group in this board, and the elections don't happen. And without help, we'll be there until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to do that. And I, I will add, not to put you on the spot, but we have had a volunteer for ward clerk. Annie um, has agreed to help with that. Um, sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, but yes, help us, help her, and we'll make this election successful. <laughs> all together it kind of depends how long folks want to stay but it's a good estimate thank you Amy um, before we leave this topic I'd love to see a show of hands of anyone who's ever worked at the polls awesome this is great so Jeff Wick posted on Front Porch Forum asking for people to work at the polls, and he said there's a special place in heaven for the people who do this. So look around. These are the people you'd be in heaven with. It's a great crew. I would love to be in heaven with all these people. So thank you, poll workers. And I actually want to just do a special shout-out to Jerry Manick. Jerry Manick does, I think, the crappiest part of working at the polls. And he's done it for years and years and years. He shows up the night before. He sets up all the booths. He's there at 6.30 on election day, making sure everything is ready for the first people who will arrive at the polls. So Jerry, thank you for your many years of service. And I'll do it again. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, our next presentation is um, going to be Burlington Telecom. We have Mike Lucy and Enos Sohovic, and I probably butchered that name, and um, they're going to talk about service in the parts of our ward that don't currently have service. So they welcome your questions, and they'll explain a little bit about the current situation.
Yeah, so I messed up. So uh, Ennis and Andy are not from BT. They're from Burlington Electric, and thank you for being here. Well, good evening. Thank you for uh, inviting us to your NPA meeting here at Ward 6. I'm Mike Lucy. I'm the general manager with Burlington Telecom. I've been there nine months. Um, with me tonight is Will Deshane. Will is our manager of construction. He's been actually with Burlington Telecom. This is his 15th year, so he has deep knowledge, experience with what's going on with the builds, what we're trying to do. Um, give you a little bit of background for me. I came most recently from Velco. I'm an engineer by academic training, um, working primarily in the telecommunications space when it comes to developing, monetizing uh, various systems. Uh, at Velco, we built basically a 1,500-mile system throughout the state of Vermont over a nine-year period of which I led that charge. So that kind of gives you a little bit of background uh, on that. Um, on, your, on your table tonight that we brought, just to give you some examples, we've taken a look recently, since Schurz has purchased uh, BT on the last, uh, actually spent 10 months for them, um, some of the areas in and around uh, what we call the hill section, what we refer to as the hill section. Um, so I've got a couple examples of diagrams that we've been able to secure from the city DPW, as well as working with Burlington Electric as to what projects they may have going on in these areas or in these streets. So historically, BT has worked with BED with cooperating on different builds, difficult builds. But the key is, do they have a capital need the same time that we're available to work with them? Um, so I don't know. We don't really, it doesn't sound like Burlington uh, Electric at this point has any major excavation work going on. We also know that the DPW, who we've been in concert with, that they don't have any major projects going on either in the next two years. The reason that that's important is you'll take a look at this first diagram, which is DeForest Heights. The second one is Overlake and then DeForest Road. I just pulled three that were sent to us. The key point to be us being successful at trying to make this work and make it feasible is really understanding what it's going to take to construct up there. Uh, on these various roads. Um, so you can see this top one, it actually has electric, it has gas, it has high pressure water main, it has a combined sewer and wastewater line. Um, there's also Comcast and Consolidated up in those areas. So basically what that means is that when you try to dig and install a new conduit, for instance, you've got a significant amount of utilities that you have to work around. And if they're in rock, it makes it very slow and very expensive. So we want to make sure that we're measured about how we go about looking at our feasibility study. So we have done a conceptual design for the area. We have done a schedule of costs. So we actually have some idea, if things went well, what that might cost up there. What would help us be more successful at working with you is really understanding what is the interest of the residents in these areas. Who would be, who would be, uh, who would commit to taking service, for instance? That would be an example. Yeah, I don't need no hands right now, but I like that. Yeah, double hands, I know. Yeah. So I've been calling CPS um, yep. um, Burlington Telecom for about the last 20 years, and I ask them to do feasibility studies from time to time. And our neighbors on Chittenden Drive here have, like, some have worked around and had, the, like, they have lines going through their backyards to get service. Exactly. Um, and you know, we, unfortunately, Chitton Drive is a private road. It was built in the 67, and Tony Connell has been trying to sell to the city for like a dollar ever since, and they don't want to expand their um, budget. But, you know, one of the Department of Public Works first people said that under, oh, it's the good kind. But, so I don't know how, so I tried to get Vermont Gas to come up the road. Mm -hmm. But if you guys could work in concert so we could get these services at the same time. Absolutely. But I, yeah, I also, I don't know. I, I don't know. Can I? That's frustrating. Can I pay the Nordic oh. yeah. yeah. Sorry, Vermont Gas is supposed to come this evening as well, but they had to cancel due to the storm. They 
couldn't safely get their guys here and back to where they needed to be. So anyway, the attempt was made to have it come here. here. But, you know, but they had they, 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 but Burlington Telecom is work, we're willing to collaborate with any party that has any kind of excavation work that's going on in these areas. It may be piecemeal because there may be certain areas that Vermont Gas needs to build because they have it in other parts. We're willing to work with them in a piecemeal fashion as well. As BED has new work that goes on in the future, we're willing to work with them as well. If that's what we need to try to drive the capital costs down to make this commercially reasonable at all. So that's the challenge is the density and the cost of the build. Right, so we have out of date sewer systems and you know underground power lines that haven't been serviced in years and the roads falling apart. So there's definitely a need there for yes. the utilities to get together and address the situation in concert with the city, but I don't think there's much I can do. I certainly can't fund the work. So No, I mean and we have met uh, with Darren Springer, um, my counterpart over at B E D. Um, obviously with uh, Moreau, the mayor, uh, we've had a lot of lengthy discussions with him as well as his team in the DPW. So they're all aware that, you know, Shure's Communications, Burlington Telecom, our owner, we're willing to work and try to get up there. We're, we genuinely want to get up there. We've actually spent quite a bit of time trying to look at what the costs would be and what the risks are and what we don't know. So we can't really get a good feasibility study until we know primarily two pieces of information. How many, which streets, so I guess that's two right there, and the third is we would like to do some exploratory work along those roads, which means just basically cutting a hole in the road. Plenty of holes already. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can see. What we're trying to understand is what is the sub-base up there? If they have a sub-base that is, goes down 18 inches that we can directionally bore through, we can do that cost in a matter of a weekend. Is there any overhead service on Chittenden Drive? Mm, Telephone? Just at the very bottom of the hill from my driving the area. We're on Kingsland and we have overhead Burlington Telecom service that yep. works very well. So I don't think you have to absolutely collapse the ledge to get at least your service in. Um, the, the, the overhead just stops right here at the light post. Okay. Yep. Seems like that's easy, an easier solution than collapsing the ledge. So we, we actually have serviced two homes in the Crescent area off of that side row. So we are looking to be as creative as we can be to try to get the services in there. I'm sure most of the people, we could look at knowing a case where we actually install, you know, so poles, I, but my guess is... Yeah, I, I already tried that, so I had, I made an appointment with Burlington Telecom, I don't know, 15 years ago, and they showed up, and they were ready to do poles, and they had to get the permission of the people who lived up the street, <coughs> and they would not get permission because it blocked the lake view, so it was a... One pole's going to block a lake view? Yeah, so the road block. sort of curves, and it, people up the hill have a... But these are great discussions that you can have with your neighbors to actually start to vet some of this. But, yes, yes. So you only have to go down 18 inches? For ours, yes. Yep, the so water and sewer goes deeper, but I also know that quite a bit of the water up there, based on discussions with the DPW, is actually pretty shallow as well um, because of the rock. They also did a combined water-sewer line, which is really, in the environmental world, not a great solution because of the overages of spillage when storm waters come into it. So they probably did that purposely because of the cost to get two separate lines in there that they needed space. So that's probably why they did that. So if you know that there's a sewer line there, you know there isn't any ledge where the sewer line runs, where the gas line runs, why can't you just follow what you know is already in the ground? So we do have as-built maps that we've obtained. The challenge with that is if the sewer main or a water line has a break and they need to get in there to service that water line, their hole is going to be at least three to four feet wide because they're going to have to set what's called a trench box and so they can be safe in a hole per ocean. In order to do that, we wouldn't be able to have our conduit there because that's obviously going to constrict their ability to do that work. So would we look at that? We would look at that. But the chances are of that being a practical solution is probably not great. And it also depends on after they put that sewer line in, what did they actually put back in as fill? Is that something that we can drill through or easily dig? If it is, that gives us more data of which now we can assess what the cost might be. Yes? I understand on uh, Summit Ridge, utilities are underground along the side sidewalk. And I think when they put them in, they put in extra pipe for utilities in the future. 
And I know that Telecom has a, 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 a service at the bottom of uh, Cliff and Willard, that new house that was built there. They have service. And that's like two houses from mine. Yeah, so we do have a what's called a conduit agreement with BED for them to let us know do they have spare conduits available on these roads. That was a discussion that we actually had last week to try to take a look at that. But before we spend money, because it costs us money to do that, we want to make sure that we have interest on those roads for us to be able to spend that capital dollars to go ahead and look at them. So they actually charge by the job, which I don't think would be exorbitant, but we just don't want to spend money if it doesn't make sense. Well, they I've been calling in, my wife's been calling in, and uh, we keep repeatedly saying, I don't know. So I'm Andy, uh, Director of Engineering at BED. So as Mike mentioned, uh, we do have an agreement in place already with Burlington Telecom to allow them to share our conduit system where it's feasible to do so. Uh, so we do have the list of locations that we're interested in possibly, uh, or BT is interested in serving. So we're going to look through those and see, you know, start the investigation process and see if it's feasible to share our conduits. Uh, yes. Right. Would it be uh, helpful if in a neighborhood, like I live on Over Lake, I don't think Comcast is a particularly popular <laughs> operation on Over Lake Park. If we committed, and, like we got a group of neighbors that committed in writing that we'll switch if you build this, would that help you? Or not? That's absolutely part of the feasibility study. How many residents would commit on which roads? So we have an understanding. We can then go in and take a look at what is it going to really cost to build there. We would have to do some exploratory work, subsurface exploratory work, so we understand what the cost might be. Because if it's rock and we have to hydraulically hammer that rock to get our pipe in, that's a totally different cost than if we can do directional drilling. So if we can do directional drilling, it's a much more economical way to do it for multiple reasons. So. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to provide people with uh, parameters of what they'd be getting into. I assume that people who aren't served here by uh, Burlington Telecom are served by the other telecom utility, Comcast. I recently moved downtown, so I feel like my numbers are pretty fresh. Uh, Comcast wanted to offer me good internet service. Upload, download, YouTube video. I mean, what are we doing on the internet? Watching stuff, killing our brains with TV. Um, but Burlington Telecom was willing for only $120, 20% more, to offer double the formidable, robust infrastructure that we are privileged enough to receive here in Burlington as a gigabit city with fiber optic infrastructure. Yeah. Now, a lot of you are probably at home with your YouTubes and your Netflixes, and maybe you have a kid at home who's you know eating up some of your bandwidth. But I want you to know that as a media professional, I used to work with Charlie at Channel 17, I can tell you that 4K video is going to become the new de rigueur standard. And as 4K starts to eat up your bandwidth, you're going to start feeling the pitch from Comcast. And Comcast, as we know, has not much interest in holding down rates. So it might be good for you all as a community to get ahead of increasing utility bills and having to double your service, get the platinum service, let's say, just in order to you know watch Friends. Period. Yeah. Thanks for telling us what we don't have and can't get. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that this is in the order of tens of thousands of dollars, though, per resident. I mean, I've, I've been on this road so many times with Vermont Gas, and they, you know, they said they could come to my house and give me a quote of twelve thousand dollars in two thousand and two, and then it was thirty thousand dollars. Next time I asked them, and people have because people have up the road it's like sort of jury rig access to gas that they don't need it, so all the costs is on us. So it's it would be awesome, but I certainly don't have tens of thousands of dollars after the tens of thousands of dollars that I've spent in taxes already to, to pay for it, you to Yes, to go out alone. Yeah. But that's why this data is very important, understanding how many people, what they think they would like to take. We can then assess on a road-by-road -road basis, you know, what seems to make sense and what the economics look around that. We have to be commercially reasonable when we go to our lenders, right? They look at our capital projects. They ask about what is our return on our investment. Fortunately, with Shures Communications, we actually have a little more room than some of our competitors because it is privately held. They are a little more aggressive. They do work in small to medium-sized cities in four other states across the, the United States as well. So this is a, a common thing for them. But we have to have those numbers 
so that when we go to our lenders, it helps us with our lending. Wait, you want to hand there, yeah. Sure. So I live on uh, Edgewood Lane. It's not pictured here, but we have neither gas nor BT. Yeah. Uh, we're five houses. So I was I wondering, and I appreciate the explanation about how there's some economy between you know the electric and the and the telecom service. Is there any similar economy with uh, with the gas? I yes. understand the gas folks are not going to be here tonight. Uh, they couldn't make it, I guess. But yeah, we would work with Vermont Gas, surely. So if they require, let's just say, a four-foot space around their pipe so if they can get in there and work on their gas line, because they have to be down at least three feet, we could easily go one foot wider and be on the outside of that and make that work. So that's somehow that we could see a cost-benefit sharing between those types of projects. So if we were to do a head count on Edgewood Lane as to what percentage of folks would want to convert, um, there would also be a cost for actually connecting from the gas main, correct, to the houses. That would be our cost. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how Vermont Gas structures that. Uh, Burlington is, is included in the service unless we run into something like we have to bring in a draw brand to get in there, for instance. But if we don't have to do that. It's included when you sign up for service for us up to 150 feet. So, you know, that's one of the conditions that we would want to look at, right? So we've got, we did an analysis, a quick, uh, better than napkin analysis and it's about a mile and a half of just what we call trunk just to get to the roads get to the homes there's another there's another one point quarter mile just to do all the drops if a hundred percent of the residents took it so you're looking at almost four miles of underground built so it's it's not it, you know it's quite significant when you start rolling all of that up and those numbers are, are fairly accurate so when you're, you're talking about all the streets in the ward that don't have service right now correct okay and this doesn't picture them no i just brought a few examples because but yeah it's, it's, but we do have all of the examples so we actually it's, it's every road in the ward that doesn't have yes <laughs> yeah. so as pointed out summer ridge doesn't have to have gas so that wouldn't have this yellow line this yellow dash line but it does have the other lines on that one for instance so if, if we were to do a head count, yes. as to how many folks would be willing to sign up yes. for gas and BP, yes. to whom would we submit it? You can submit it to me. Okay, and would, right. that would be communicated to all three as you work together? Well, sure. We could, yeah, we could take that point lead. I just want to make sure it doesn't become, yes, I mean, we could take the point on that, sure. Yeah, we're happy to work with Vermont Gas. Uh, we know the folks over there, obviously, Burlington, we know as well. So that's, yeah, that's something we can take the lead on. I just want to make sure it doesn't become like a, you know, full-time, full-time job. So if you, the much more data you can get to us, the easier it makes my job. I'm happy to reach out to them and try to help me. Yes. It's, yes. It's, it's a little surprising to me that we don't have a better sense of who would be interested. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of serious about this. For a very reasonable price, I'd be willing to knock on all those doors. <laughs> my, my wife just did the flyering for the neighborhood. And I was working. She was only gone a couple hours. Can't be that many people. So interesting enough, we, we actually just enlisted three college students that are seniors in the marketing program. They actually went and did a door-to-door -door survey of areas that we could have served for over two years just to try to get real data from those residents who seem to be not taking our service, because we don't really know why without asking them, right? You could do a survey monkey, but that doesn't really work, so we sent out these college kids to actually do it. So we're trying to get that data. So you would think everybody would want it, but we have some areas that, you know, we, we're 20% of a take rate. That's a very, very low wow. take rate. So it's a very important number. When it's a tight margin, these numbers are very important. I don't want to get ahead of anybody else here, but I'm also wondering, you know, we're talking about fiber to distribute the signal. Yes. Is there not, at this point, another technology which could be used? I mean, I keep hearing about 5G coming in. I mm -hmm. realize that's completely different technology. I realize this is obvious. I'm not an engineer. Yeah. But for a small neighborhood like this, a small area, is there no other way to broadcast that there high-speed internet there, service? There's various wireless technologies out there. Um, that can do that. I used to actually work for Sprint PCS for 15 years doing wireless build out in New England. So I have some familiarity with it. Um, there is a new license that's coming out, CDRS. They claim that that's going to give you great speeds. You have to purchase that license. Burlington has a license. And then you have to have enough, basically, capacity to get the speed that you want. The challenge with wireless and even with 5G, is you're not going to get the same speed levels that you will with fiber to the prints. So 
we have to get more information around 5G. Um, I still have friends in the industry that design and work with that, and it's still pretty early. I mean, there's a lot of claims. I heard AT&T or saw it on the Super Bowl that they're nationwide 5G. Well, let's go down to the store and ask them for a 5G phone, and you're going to see that it's not capital. So we are willing to look at that. We actually have our engineer, our VP of engineering, is on a task right now to look at wireless as a possible solution for certain areas. But that's going to require antennas, so you need a height of land. Depending on what frequency, I don't want to get too techy on you, but trees can stop it, houses can stop it, so you have to look at that. So it definitely would be cheaper than what we're proposing, bringing fiber. And that's something that we're willing to look at as well. Thank you. Yes. 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 I'd just like to ask the uh, guys from BED to speak to uh, the city's net zero energy plan. And, you know, I love the idea of bundling gas, electric, and... Uh, and telecom access at the same time, but I feel like it's not a sound investment to be building out more fossil fuel infrastructure. If the city really is trying to get homes through incentives to switch over to uh, coal climate heat pumps. So can you guys just speak to um, where BED is at with the net zero plan and um, how you would weigh in on the idea of bringing Vermont gas in as a partner? I'm probably not the right person to weigh in on that. Um, if you want, Give him the I can microphone. take your name down and Give him the, mic the right person to talk to about that. Give, Give him the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't want to report it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm saying I'm not really prepared to talk about that tonight. I'm not really in that area. But I can certainly take your name down and, and get with the right person. I mean, I, I would like to see um, the city have a holistic approach. I think the net zero energy plan is um, a great realistic conversation about what it's going to take for us to get to a, a sustainability right. you know, I mean, a, a climate you are, footprint that matters. You are correct in that the net zero plan does uh, promote the use of coal climate heat pumps and obviously wants to get us away from fossil fuels. And I know there's been some talk with Vermont Gas about renewable natural gas. I'm not sure where that stands, but. Well, yeah. you know, as a community, I'd like to see us put our money into the technologies of the future and not the technologies of the past. Right. So I can speak to that a little bit because I've been down that road. So we um, I have to buy propane, which the price varies a lot, and it's super expensive. So I live right over here on Chittenden Drive. So early on, I switched my fireplaces to wood pellet stoves, which is a lot of carrying stuff around and messy. We just installed three heat pumps, and there are a lot of rebates and everything, but I had to take out a loan for $13,000 to do that. Our boiler that I installed 15 years ago with BEDs, you know, they have great rebates, went, and we just had to put in a $7,000 boiler. At that point, we looked at a hot water pump that would be uh, like with the heat pump technology, but it's not far enough along. It was also super costly. So I honestly, for like, I feel like I've spent a lot of money trying to just, we had Vermont gas. Uh, I'm still stuck with propane for hot water. Can't get away from it because it was too costly to go with a heat pump hot water. And that technology is just not far enough along yet. I know there's, you, been, there's been some improvements recently. Like, They're working on a few new things. But and I talked to Chris Burns. He's like, everybody's yeah. boiler in the south end is in their garage, which is not great for putting in heat pumps. So you need to create yeah. space in your house for it, basically, which was like redesign and work. But yeah. I just don't, it's not, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you, and I have like an electric car, but it's, it's still so much cost on the consumer to be net energy and until the city can figure out how to support people. I don't think it's realistic. I mean, of course, it's going to cost us a lot to put gas in. It's I know, I know. I'm, I can't even go. I can't even think about that at point. I spent so much money trying to be energy efficient and to save the cost of heat that I, I would have just paid for the propane to begin with. It would have been cheaper. <laughs> Burlington Telecom. I've just been curious about what yes. percentage of residences in Burlington do not have access to Burlington Telecom right now. Do you have an idea? Uh, of those, there's 121 that don't because of the high cost. There's an additional 343, roughly, that have chosen not to take it. They have. It's a private. They could if they wanted. They could if they wanted. Yeah. Um, but the build there is different, so it's really we have to get an agreement on the private lands, just much like Chittenden Drive. And have to do. Um, so that's basically. Other than that, we serve 
or can serve everything but 700 residences, basically. But, but of those that you can serve, what percent choose not to? Well, we have those that we can serve. Well, it'd be 53 percent. We're 43 percent have taken our service. Yes. So the big part of the picture, well, two parts, is how many people will subscribe, and, and the other part is, is working with the other utilities to get the cables in. So since we've been trying to do this for 20 years, how does it work that the utilities inform you that they're going to do a project so that you can examine whether you can get cables in? Is there a mechanism for that happening? Because I, I don't... I'm skeptical that that's going to happen. I don't know if historically more. there was a good mechanism with everything that was surrounding, everything that was going on. We definitely do. I mean, and what is it? Well, I mean, but somebody at Burlington Gas, yes, we, Burlington Electric will call you. We'll and say look at their doing. annual build plans. What are they doing? Where are they doing? What are they actually doing? Like they're going to be doing some water. Like DPW is going to be doing some water relining in some of the streets in the hills. What we call the hill section. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't really help us because they only have to open up a small section to access those pipes. It's not like they have to open up a whole room. So we are in communications with the city. The city absolutely knows that we're committed to trying to do something. So those lines of communication are open for sure. That's on an annual basis? Yes. Everybody sets their budgets. We have to have a heads up so we can get it into our budget system as well. Yes, Karen. Um, so, Mike, thank you. Thanks very much for being here, for agreeing to come, and to all of you for being here. Um, I hope that people will look upon, uh, the, well, first wanted to backtrack and also um, thank Barbara, Barbara Crook, for reaching out to me about two months ago um, and asking for a meeting like this. We talked about having it as a neighborhood meeting and agreed to have this as part of an NPA. And uh, for those people that are on the affected streets, um, a group of us did go and um, deliver something to your door and um, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I hope that people will look upon this as, um, uh, you know, even though there have been a number of people that have been wanting this service for a very long time, that we try to look at this as a first step in moving forward now. Um, and if there are people that are here who live, on, for those people who are here who live on, on the streets that are affected, that they will start that conversation with their neighbors um, I didn't mean to take the mic, but um, that they will start that, that conversation with their neighbors because that's really the first step in getting moving. Um, I did meet with Mike um, uh, and Will about uh, a week ago. I can attest to the fact that they have put a tremendous amount of time and effort into figuring out how to make this work. Um, they have modeled this and uh, um, and I, I firmly believe that they do want to make this happen. So, but the first step is going to be those neighbors um, organizing um, and committing to being to taking the service. So, uh, there's no better advertising than neighbor to neighbor. And I hope that we can get that started so that all of you who I know want the service can get it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. As, as a matter of efficiency, too, I mean, I'm happy to be the starting person, but if we could funnel the streets as you get your information through one person so that I don't miss it in my emails, not knowing all of the residents here, that would be very helpful, you know, so I know who to reach out to, who not to reach out to, whether it's VED, whether it's Vermont Gas, so. I'm just going to hop in for a sec. Because Vermont Gas is not here tonight, we have extra time for you folks, so don't hesitate to ask your questions. We uh, can keep them going until 725, so feel free to take advantage of having this time to have sure. direct conversations with them. I, don't, uh, I guess I, I'm wondering what's involved in putting Burlington Telecom in, say, Chittenden Drive in the forest, which already has underground electric and so I imagine there's conduits uh, that you could run the, the fiber objects along um, to those you know up the streets into those houses is that a major ordeal because Comcast is there now so that that's part of the investigation that we kind of referred to earlier uh, we actually have to send a crew out to start looking in the conduit system to see if there's any spare conduits 
And if we don't have any spares, then it's a little bit more difficult to share our conduit space with uh, BT. And, and how much space to, I mean, is there like, there needs to be a certain distance <coughs> to the new fiber optic? Um, ideally, we would have an empty conduit that we could allow them to use, right. and then we wouldn't have to worry about spacing. But even if there um, wasn't, I mean, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of the work involved and the cost. To, I imagine it'd be a lot less expensive than trying to do it in conjunction with Vermont Gas, which needs a lot deeper uh, area. And right. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen those costs to use a VED conduit, mm -hmm. so I would reserve it. My opinion as to whether or not it's cheaper or not, I don't, I don't know yet. That's so not something that you've done other places. So we have, but each, 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 each build is kind of unique. So there was one that we did where they actually pulled a whole new conductor along with the fiber. Mm -hmm. So that's a different kind of a, that's a different type of a build. So you have to understand really what it is, and then we can get the cost would be easy to get. We just need to know where. What is the average cost per consumer to get these conduits? Is there? I know it's each instance is going to be a little bit different, but a, a, a better way to answer that: if we're able to do directional drilling, mm -hmm. not open up the streets, minimize that, and we can actually drill, we're probably in the three hundred thousand dollar range to do what we've been talking about. So then you'd have to do the math. So now it depends on how many residents take the service, what level of service do they take, which drives our revenue model. We can then bounce that off of what our capital costs are and see if we can get an actual model. Do you know how many residents are in this four and a half mile stretch you described? 85. So Based on my numbers, $300, yes. $300,000 divided by 85 then, at best? Yes. Yep, at a very high level. Right. And that would be without Debt service, anything crazy, correct. <clears throat> yes? Comcast just dig a trench along the, the green belt. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be 18 inches deep? We have to be 18 inches deep and we have to be 18 inches away from them. Why, why do you have to be 18 inches and they can just kind of... Once again, it gets to, if they were there first, they would have to be 18 inches away from us as well. So... Um, That's in but the depth, you have to be... Yes, because we put ours in conduit. They may have done direct burial. I don't know. They the do problem with direct burial is you're going to be replacing that before long. That's the challenge with that. But it's a lot less expensive than $300,000. Uh, I don't think I would I agree with that because you're, you're using a different method called plowing. And if you can plow, it will be cheaper than directional drilling, but it's not going to be $100,000. But Comcast has done it already, so it's yeah, they also have. The yeah, yeah, I don't know their models or when they did it or how they did it. You also have to remember that if you're in those green spaces with the trees, we actually have to stay five feet outside the drip zone of mature trees per the city's arborist rules. So that really limits, like if you go down Oak, Oak Lake, for instance, you really can't get in that green space. So now you're under the sidewalks which is very, very expensive being the sidewalks, probably actually may even be more expensive than being, actually being in the roadway. So if we can get into the road next to the curb, and that's drillable, that is really the ideal solution for us to save the most cost, if we can't work with somebody else and find synergies in the construction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike and team. Okay. Everyone's sick tonight. Um, so thank you for coming. And uh, because we have extra time, uh, because of Vermont guests not being here, we are going to move to our next agenda item now. So because we're ahead on time, we'd like to take a second to tell everybody to please eat. Um, the food is from the uh, Burlington School District. Um, so everything that you folks eat is everything we don't have to take home. So please eat. Take the time to eat. Uh,
Okay. Okay. And I've been asked to ask you folks that when you're done with the silver, put it, put it in the end tub so we can wash it tonight before we leave. So next on the agenda is um, an update from the Burlington School District from Burlington School Board member Jeff Wick. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Wick. I'm vice chair of the Burlington School Board. Um, I'm also on the negotiations committee. And tonight, you've asked me to specifically address four issues. Maybe we'll get the uh, quickest and easy ones quickest and easiest ones out of the way first. Um, and I'm, I'm just, we, we've got quite a turnout tonight. I actually <laughs> thought with the snow, nobody would be here. But so look at this. We've got a, a great crowd. We already were coming. <laughs> and look at the food. And geez, I think I missed our musicians, right? Anna, Anna and Andy. Did I miss it? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Excellent. Um, qu I'll take the questions a little bit out of order that you ask. The first one was, tell us what you can tell us about the Edmonds Elementary School principal vacancy and filling that. And so, um, as you know, uh, Shelley Matthias, the uh, current principal who's been there for quite some time, is retiring and uh, creating a va that therefore obviously creates a vacancy. So I spoke with the superintendent this afternoon and I said, what, what can I tell my constituents Ward 6? And he said, Jeff, just let them know we'll have an update, a public update next week. But right now, uh, we, we can't talk about it. So that's why I started with this one. It was very short and easy. We all expect to have more information about filling that vacancy next week. All right, that's Edmonds Elementary School. Let's see, um, we've got a few interesting things going on. Let me take the next one that I think is going to be relatively brief in my delivery, but when we have questions, it may not be the, it may be the popular one, I don't know. This has to do with the renovations at the high school. Give us the update. What is the update, Jeff, we have heard? Well, we, we all passed the authorization for um, the school district to spend up to $70 million to renovate the high school. And as, as you may know, um, <clears throat> what happened a few months ago is after, I think they call it the first round of schematic design and other uh, physical examination of the property, it was determined that uh, the, the project was, go it was looking like it was going to cost a lot more than 70 to complete. In fact, I think the number was 91 million. We were all rather shocked. And uh, they assured us that that was just the first round. They're going to then do the second round of schematic design and sharpen their pencils and figure out what needs to change to bring it back down uh, to what we asked and what you'd authorized. And um, one of the most substantial changes um, that it appears will we may, well, actually, sorry. Um, let's see, what did I want to note about that? What, 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 was, what was one of the most remarkable, why was it so much more expensive? Well, in part, it turns out um, that the soils around the, I'll call it the south side of A building, uh, the south side of the, what is it, Joel, the gym, right? Yeah, the gym. Turns out, you probably know this already, but if you don't, I guess uh, sand and other, um, they're much softer than, than anticipated. And so that it turns out that we'd have to stick these pilings down much further than anticipated and that a lot of the cost increase would, a lot of the cost of the project would go underground. So, you know, who wants the cost to go underground? We want it to go where it means something. So I think they're redesigning what was going to be this wraparound of the gym and the auditorium and redesigning that. So one of the most substantial changes in the pending 
sort of redesign is the elimination of the wraparound design due to unfavorable soil conditions discovered during testing work. Um, so the next step, what, what is the next step? We're all eager to know the next step because we would like, obviously, to get a great renovation on budget. The next step is that Black River Design, who are the architects with whom we've been working on this project, they're going to present to this committee that you probably know exists, which is a partnership between the City of Burlington and the school district called the uh, Building and Construction Oversight Committee, BCOC. Uh, Black River is going to present to the BCOC their recommendations after several months of attempting to redesign, their recommendations to bring the project costs down to budget, at which point that committee will evaluate how these proposed changes will affect the project's uh, priority goals. And just to remind everybody what our priorities were, um, improved accessibility, meaning, you know, for those who are disabled, uh, it's, it's very spread out, so improved accessibility, uh, improved security, energy efficiency, and what's come to be known as 21st century learning environments. So um, we're all waiting to see what that looks like. And when is that meeting? Well, there's a public meeting of that committee, the BCOC, February 20th, if you're curious, the public is welcome to attend February 20th um, to discuss and focus on the cost-saving options that have been identified or that will be identified. The meeting will be held at Edmonds Middle School in the library, which is also known as the Makerspace, at 5.30 p.m. So if anyone would like to attend, 5.30, Feb 20, Edmonds Middle School. I'm planning to attend. I'm very eager to know. Um, okay, so that's two of the four items. Um, one was the budget. That's, for me, the biggie, the school budget. But the fourth, well, what was that fourth? Or am I just imagining there was a fourth? We've got Edmonds. Ah, superintendent. Yes, search. I do have a whole packet on that, in fact. So what I'll do is, because this is a big one, and you are rightly very curious about it. And there were 27 people signed in, so I might not have enough. I've got 25 copies here of what we call our superintendent search one pager. So that, you know, if you listen to me for two minutes on it, you know, don't worry if you remember it all or not. It'll be right here. So maybe I'll pass some in different directions. Thanks. <laughs> I need my notes. Okay, superintendent search. What's going on? You, uh, everybody knows the superintendent uh, finishes his term here June 30th. So as of July 1, the new fiscal year, we, we plan to have a new superintendent in place. Okay, here are the bullet points. We have, what have we done so far? Well, we have internally, as a board, we've appointed the su superintendent search committee. That is chaired by two of our commissioners, one whose name is Kendra Sowers, and the other, Martine Gulick. Um, Claire Wool's also on the committee, sort of a standing member. Uh, we've hired, we put out sort of an RFP, and we uh, ended up hiring one of those national superintendent search firms. There aren't that many, actually, nationally. One we've hired is called McPherson and Jacobson. They've placed over 750 superintendents across the U.S. since 1991. Uh, there's a particular consultant from the firm who's working, been assigned to us. His name is John Grotto. Uh, he was at our January 14th board meeting to do some work on this with us. Um, what else? If you would like to go to our website at the school district, we've got as much information as we possibly can give you on this process. Uh, we've held three uh, what we call community stakeholder forums, one at Hunt, one at Champlain Elementary, and one at IAA, Integrated Arts Academy, our, one of our elementary schools in the Old North End. And we've posted all that feedback on the district website. We have additional stakeholder meetings coming up. And we've had some already with employees of the school district, students, 
uh, employees would include teachers as well. Okay, now what else are we doing? We have recently set up what's called a screening committee. Um, as broadly as we could, we attempted to let the public know uh, we're taking applications for the screening committee, and a number of folks did return applications. There were 30 applications, and uh, at the end of the day, 11 were chosen to be on that committee. The makeup of the committee consists of two school principals, one teacher, two employees from the district central office, one other school district employee, and five members from the community at large. And so they're the screening committee. They are going to uh, essentially review the applications as they come in, and then um, ultimately it is the school board's job to select the next superintendent. So they'll essentially be referring those applications to us. The closing date for applications was actually today. And I, I heard we have received uh, a number of applications. The screening committee initially meets on the 11th of February to review the applications. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's their initial meeting on the 11th. On the 18th of February, they then meet again to review the apps, to view various candidate videos, and then to advance acceptable candidates to the school board. On March 4th, um, that right after election day, right after February break, the board, the school board, will interview those candidates at a time and location to be determined. And then on March 5th, there will be a public or community forum with the finalists. Again, we'll announce the time and location. So the, the public will have a chance, just as the school board did the day before, to listen to the candidates and, I hope, ask candid questions. And then we expect to make an announcement of our selection, and I hope acceptance, by mid-March. So if all goes according to this plan, mid-March, we should know who our next superintendent will be. It does sound a little soon to me. <laughs> yes, sir. Question, can you tell us about the compensation for the consultants? Um, if I knew that answer right now, I would tell you. Um, I can find out, and I can certainly get back to you. And if there are other things I cannot answer tonight, my email address is jwick, J-W-I-C-K, at bsdvt.org. Ooh. <laughs> you have Burlington. Oh, no, that's the school district. BSD, Burlington yeah. School District VT. Um, yeah, we might as well take the questions as we see them. The gentleman. Hi. There. Thank you, Mr. School Commissioner. Uh, I used to cover Burlington Development Review Boards, where a lot of new buildings, creative ones, creatively using land, especially close to the waterfront, have recently been certified, including by, I believe it's one of the, the alternate um, members of the Development Review Board, who works for Black River Design. Now, they sent the uh, redstone uh, cliff hanging apartments back to square one multiple times, and Eric Hoekster did an amazing job at doing nips and tucks, and they decided and they located these sandy uh, geographies as something into which they'd have to drive exceptionally deep pylons. Now, I don't have the greatest memory, I smoke a lot of pot sometimes, but <laughs> even I know that those pylons were detected by the Development Review Board, mm -hmm. were insisted upon in order to have the building, you know, like, <laughs> not fall off the cliff. Right. And now it seems like every single time a big project, whether it's a private project or whether it's a public project goes before the DRB, they seem to just walk between the raindrops. And then when you send a budget to the, to the voters, it's curiously off the mark in terms of what the actual budget ends up being. So I guess, am I being paranoid in thinking that certain projects kind of skate through the process? especially before they go before the voters with these important, life-changing property tax increases for some people who are absolutely pushed to the margins of their finances. Is it fair to think that I have a tinfoil hat on that basically hoaxer got nailed, but BSD walked between the raindrops? What's going on? Well, I don't think we've put our, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but the timing of permitting is I don't think we've applied for permits for a building yet. So we haven't been before the DRB. 
Well, and anyway, he's, even though yeah. he's a member of the DRB, he was unable to detect and guess that this would be a much heavier lift and a much deeper dive into the Earth than we had expected. I mean, is that, am I completely off the mark here? You know, let me know. So I think I, I totally get where you're going and what you're saying, because the question has arisen in my mind, which is, um, how were we sold something at a $70 million price tag? And after whatever the extensive schematic process was, it came in higher. Um, that, that's a very good question that I don't know the answer to. You can bet that I'm no happier than you are about that. And um, it is my hope that some of these costs, well, I'll find out more detail, especially at February 20th. But yeah, I, I believe me, um, if you rerun the tape from the school board meeting where we approve this thing. There were three scenarios put up, and here's what you can get for scenario A, B, and C, and um, one of them was just very expensive, and so we went for the middle one. It was 68.5, but then I personally raised a question about air conditioning. I said, hey, you know, this is crazy. We really need air conditioning, and so sort of on the fly there, they suggested, all right, well, if you, the board, want air conditioning, why don't you just all we can do right now is just add a little. So, in a, in any event, as a result of that, um, we passed the seventy. We approved the seventy million, or recommended to the voters seventy million. That was sixty-eight five plus the air conditioning, and so now it's yeah. It's, well, 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 I'm told though, in their defense, that it's not unusual for the first round of schematics to come in perhaps higher. I'm, well, I get it. Th thank you. I know you're in my corner, and I'm not even in your ward. So thank you. Okay. Um, Dan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on one thing about the question about um, consultant compensation. Because I learned this working on the superintendent search a little bit. But there's, there's several national consultants. And they serve almost as like little mini Ebays or LinkedIn's. So all the prospects go to these firms. And these firms deal with all the school districts. And if you don't hire one of these firms, you're not going to get the lead flow. So they, they're not monopolies, but they're really important. They do more than just come in and talk to you. They have the lead flow of the candidates. So you kind of you have to work with somebody. Thanks for that clarification, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, if, if the question was raised, do you use one of these firms or do you go without it, I would certainly suggest that we probably uh, prudence would dictate we would we would use one but uh, question still on the table is how much does that cost so I'll, uh, email me I'll get back to you okay um, okay we talked about superintendent search I really want to reserve some time for the most important thing because that's the thing we'll all be voting on which is the school budget for the upcoming fiscal year and I have a handout oh Joel so sorry I have a handout on that too I've kept one for myself already. I've got 25 here. So it's double-sided. I'm sorry it's not in color, but I'm sure you don't mind. The original is in color. I just didn't have a color printer. All right. Here's the short of it. The short of it is our current school year, the one we're in right now. The estimated uh, the budget is... Just shy of 89 million, so 88.7. Um, if we add no new programs, um, no new teachers, no new personnel, just sort of a steady state or baseline budget, it turns out uh, the estimate is that our budget would, what I'll call, naturally increase um, by almost 4% to 92 million. And what would make up that? natural increase? Well, it turns out that health insurance premiums, as you all know, I'm sure, they go up by double digit amounts, but in this case we're told 13% your premium is going up. And so that's pretty substantial when you have, well, I think we have about 1,200 employees in the Burlington School District. Um, also, uh, there is somewhat of a natural increase in wages, um, and if not wages per se, there's a step system that teachers are on that progressively raises their um, 
salaries based on experience and education, master's degree, that sort of thing. Uh, that's a component of it. Special education costs, we're told, are increasing, as well as anticipated borrowing costs relating to the first phase of the BHS project. Um, if you did your homework, which I'm sure you did a year ago, we all knew it would not be cheap when we started to borrow for the high school. And it was frankly my hope that the community would, would approve the bond, because we need the new high school, uh, but that, that that new spending would not crowd out. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't be at the expense of uh, gutting the personnel to actually teach our kids. So that's my hope for the future, but that's a few years away, because this year, the increase due to the first amount we're going to have to draw down in about a year or within a year, the increase isn't that large. If memory serves, it was about, it added about 750000 to our budget. Um, so that's the first phase of the BHS project. In addition, we are obviously now paying down the debt that the voters approved a number of years ago for what we called our 10-year capital plan. So that also adds to the the budget. I'm not sure what that amount is. So those are the things that sort of inherently increase the budget without adding any bodies or programming. Um, and then what we, the board, did is we, together with our administration, found about a million dollars of cuts. And um, then we did, we did find, we did desire and propose uh, new investments of about 360,000. So it netted, if you, you know, reduce by 1.1 million and you add back 360, you know, the difference is roughly <coughs> 600 and what, 660 or so. But the net net of that is that our total budget uh, in the next school year that begins July 1 is increasing 3.18%. So just to use round numbers, 3%. However, sadly, uh, <coughs> due to what I'll call the miracle of state education funding, that is expected to have a, an education property tax increase for those who do not get a discount on their property taxes based on income. Those who are over that threshold, who just pay the full load of the tax bill, that's expected to have an increase of 7%, 7.36 to be exact. But that, that's, that's precision without being correct because that's based on current estimates. There are a few items that could change, namely one, how the state ends up funding. I think there's a political decision that could be made that's been made in prior years that could either make it better or worse. But as of current understanding, 3% increase in the overall budget translates to a 7% expected property tax increase. If you get a property tax discount based on your income, your increase will be less. In fact, there's some kind of generic, if you're an income-based payer, the school district estimates, and I think this is based on some legitimate numbers that other school districts use, it's, you're expected to have on average a 3% property tax increase. So as you all may know, it's so complicated because each of our property tax bills might be discounted by a certain amount based on our income. So it's one metric doesn't cover everybody. But for those who, who do not get a discount on their tax bills, presently we expect a 7% increase. <laughs> That is the story. If you'd like any more detail, I probably have it. And if I don't, I'll get it to you. So what was the expected increase last year? And what did it actually turn out to be? Do you know? Yes. I think last year the expected increase turned out to be about what we estimated. And when I got my property tax bill in July, I First thing I did when I opened it is got my little calculator and said, what was my increase on the education portion? And I think it was 4.7%. And that's about what you would estimate? I think we estimated around that. That I, I had thought we'd estimated higher, but then a commissioner recently said to me, no, Jeff, it was actually a little lower than 4.7. So it was, it was around that ballpark, four-ish, if memory serves. But in any event, the fact is, if you didn't get a discount on your tax bill, your education portion went up four, correct me if I'm wrong, but my memory says 4.7%. Now, just for comparison, not to beat anybody up, but I watched the South 
probably shouldn't say this, but we're not alone in our increases. The city of South Burlington is expecting an 11% increase in their education property taxes. Uh, next. Yeah, just a comment. Michelle and I lived out in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, for a number of years where they have very low taxes. Mm -hmm. And they had 42 kids in their AP courses. Mm -hmm. Kids were sitting on window cells and on the floor because they didn't have chairs. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you either have good schools or you have low taxes. I don't see how you do both. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Alan? I was Given my background, I know that one of the differences often between what's going to happen with our tax bill and what's actually going on in the underlying budget has to do with the number of students or, you know, the equalized pupil mm -hmm. numbers, but it's pretty close to whether or not stu student population is going up and down. Mm -hmm. Does, is some of this reflection of the 7.3 versus the 3.2 related to a change in student numbers? Uh, yes, and I have the details. I'd be delighted. That, that right. So the That's key variables. What? That's a softball. <laughs> well, it, I think it's important for a number of reasons because it's always that sometimes the community is talking about do we have capacity and don't, and you know what is happening with the buildings and the um, student numbers, and if we are, you know, if student numbers are coming down, what are we doing related to that? Yeah. So that's yeah yeah the, the, kind of the follow so on it, as well. It turns out, as you probably know. Everybody knows Alan, who's a former chair of the school board. Um, but that our student count overall in Burlington has kind of gone a little up, a little down, a little up, a little down, a little up. It, it really hasn't gone far, um, even at the high school, roughly around 1,000 students. I think now around 950, 960, something. You know, again, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but I know I'm very close. Um, and I did an analysis before I ran for the board because people were claiming various things. and. I went back to the annual reports for 10 years to see what our student count was, and it hasn't changed and it's not changing. And I mean, I'm not saying it's not changing in the future, I'm just saying it's not changing substantially one year over the other. But Alan, your question is a good one. Uh, in fact, there is a slight increase, a 1%, I'm sorry, slight decrease in our equalized pupil count by 1%, 1.25%. And equalized pupils doesn't translate into uh, kids in seats. It's equalized in that um, certain students get counted as more than one student uh, and other students, the little wee ones, get counted as less than one. So it's a sort of a number that doesn't represent actual number of students, but 1% but roughly is what we're down. And that does have a, a slightly adverse effect when it translates to the property tax adjustment. But if this year we're down, maybe next year we'll be up. You just never know. It's ne never very much, the delta. Next, any other questions? Wow. Dan? Of the three and a half million in the second line in the hmm? how much of that is health care? Because I feel like often these things get pinned down the school system, and what the school system really is is a conduit to the medical system. Mm -hmm. And it's really not, there's only so much a school system can do if the cash flows through to health care, which you know, right. Buffett described health care as a, the tapeworm of America just sucking up all the nutrients from every other industry. Right. I think it's pretty accurate, and it often gets pinned on school. So I don't know exactly how much of that three and a half is health care. Um, you know, obviously what I do know is that we've been told by our CFO that the premium goes up about 13%, is expected to. But what I think he also told me was the big four, healthcare was one of them, the big four increases were over a half a million and maybe under a million. So uh, I, I can find out, Dan, how much, but it was substantial. Joel? Um, I, for one, uh, I'm stunned that that earth in front of the high school would hold the building. I mean, that high school was built on a rock. So me for, I'm, I'm the supplier for everybody else that, um, you know, that there's no rock underneath there. Well, I hope you'll come to the meeting and we can ask those questions and really learn more. Yeah, and it, it's really hard. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that when we redid um, a building 10 years ago, we put... I think a million dollars in the air conditioning in the middle of April, and so I'm a little surprised that we would have to spend a lot more down on that in for air conditioning. I don't know if that's what I heard, but 
I was a little surprised to hear that number. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Andy? Jeff, you mentioned uh, equalized spending um, and, and how it's calculated. Um, my understanding is there's a bill in the legislature and there is some effort to, um, to modify the formulas that calculate student waiting. Right. Do you know anything about that? And can you? Uh, I, I know that the city council does, and I saw, I see Karen, but I also saw Joan Shannon. Is Joan? Joan might, have, I don't know who did it, I wasn't there, but somebody introduced a resolution in the city council just last week. Oh, there, Joan did. And to urge the legislature to take up that matter in this session. Um, you know, who knows if they'll actually do that, but it would be beneficial, substantial, I'm told, substantially beneficial to. Burlington. <clears throat> I mean, I actually, um, I'm not a, I'm not super well educated on this, but as I understand, <coughs> I would love it if you could just give us a little more background, or maybe Karen or Joan or others. Um, yeah. Burlington has a lot of revenue, relatively speaking, to other towns. It comes from payment in lieu of taxes because we have a lot of properties that are owned that are not um, taxed in the city, right? So we we have one challenge, which is we're not allowed to tax those. Landowners who are nonprofits, the hospital, the university, um, with education taxes. So they don't pay into education funding. So that's one kind of disadvantage we have. The second is that we have a population that includes a lot of new American students who do need English uh, learning support. Uh, with lots of those students, uh, and, and not only those students, but um, lots of students in our community um, have trauma in their past and really do need um, social service support. And so we have, um, we also have um, those challenges that, that are part of that funding formula for mm -hmm. how expensive students are, what, what equalized pupil count is. Mm -hmm. So am, am I right in that we have a couple of kind of structural disadvantages as a community in terms of how much state funding comes into our education? I think you've stated it very well because if, you know, the high need students right now, I think, are weighted 1.2 versus 1. But I believe there's a, I've seen it, a very substantial report out there you can find that went to the legislature that suggested that weighting those students by 1.2 is not enough. It does not reflect the cost of the system. It should be higher. And I don't remember, but anyone can shout out what that higher was. Oh, I see Brian Pine here too. Hi. But I thought it was somewhere like 1.4, or I'm not sure if they made a specific rate, but it would be enough that it would be meaningful, very meaningful to our state funding formula and therefore our, our budget and our tax rates. Absolutely. Um, so this seems like a substantial increase. You know, in my budget, it would be a substantial increase. This is a budget. substantial increase, uh, at, a 7% increase to your property taxes, I, I, I admit, is a substantial, if you do not get uh, a discount, an income sensitivity yeah, adjustment. We don't qualify for that. Yeah. <clears throat> don't have like a grand house either, but they estimated the value because we live next door. Sure. Yeah. Um, this is a tax year when we haven't started to build a new high school. Like, yeah. I'm just nervous that, you know, I obviously want good schools. Yeah. I don't mind paying taxes to have good schools. But mm -hmm. if this is a year where we actually haven't even broken ground on a new high school, what are the next couple of years? Are we looking at 7% for the next three or four years? Or is this an anomaly? Or Well, my sense is that what we're looking at, the increase attributable to the um, high school bonding, which I don't think we've drawn down any or much yet, but this is for the next fiscal year that doesn't, well, it actually starts in July. What, what I was told by our CFO is that, well, we, we did ask him, we said, well, well, geez, we haven't really started yet. Do we really need to bond for this? Do we need to actually go get the money, borrow it? And the answer was yes. We actually, because of the timing of, of when the city raises the money, probably at the back end of that fiscal year that we're budgeting for, we're going to have to draw a chunk of money um, that will that will be used for the first phase. But if your question is, well, will we, it, yeah. So the answer is yes, that's a chunk, but this is a $70 million problem. Yes, it will get worse. 
I can't say it'll get worse. It's not going to go seven, 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 seven. Eight. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it'll go, but at some point there's going to be a step where it, in terms of the bonding, we'll have drawn down all the bonding money, and so I won't be able to say to you, oh, in next year's budget we're going to be paying more because at that point we'll be the full brunt of the bond payments will kind of cap out and that'll be steady. So Jeff, we have time for yeah one more minute of okay. question or comment. No problem. Hi, I have a question about special ed. You said that, that special ed costs were on the rise, um, and you mentioned increases for teachers with masters and what have you not. In the scope of all that and with the contracting and everything, are you folks considering including paraeducators in that contract process to give them credit for further education, to increase their contracts, to have be eligible for retirement benefits? Well, you, you asked a couple of things, and the last thing I, I guess I'll admit my ignorance that I don't know enough about um, paraeducator and retirement benefits, but I can say that we just begun paraeducator bargaining as well. Because mm -hmm. our contracts have always been kept under a certain amount of hours within the district to, per, to, to not allow them to earn retirement benefits. I only know this because I, okay. you know, I was a para for 16 years. So, I, you know, some years it was 22 minutes, some years it was 45 minutes under. Huh. Okay. Well, I'm not, okay. I'm not yet familiar okay. with I just didn't any know if it was intentional in the, attempt in the, to. In the, no, in the budget, I just didn't know because you yeah. said that special ed was on the rise. I yeah. just didn't know if there was any talks about anything like that. Well, it's a good question. It's a very good, honest question. In other words, it's, you know, let's treat people well and is there more of a move towards that direction. I, I hope so, and I will support that, but obviously consistent with prudent financial, you know, management and tax increases. <laughs> the music's gonna start. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, and um, I'm sure, Jeff, you're available for answers if people want to contact you directly. Yes. Great. So one of our goals with this evening's meeting was to make sure that you had a chance to hear in depth about the ballot items that you'll be facing on election day. So we've covered the first one, which is the school tax. And there are three more ballot items. And the way we're going to break this down in terms of discussion is we're going to have uh, Michael Monty from Champlain Housing Trust and Brian Pine. He's a Ward 3 city councilor. They're going to talk about the housing trust fund assessment so they'll tell you what that's about and then Moreau Weinberger is our mayor is here and he's going to talk about the public safety tax and the charter change and uh, for more input if necessary we have a uh, fire chief I forget your first name Steve. Steve Locke is here so we'll kick off with the housing trust fund assessment discussion and then we will go from there so Michael and Brian will head on up here. So if you could just introduce yourselves, tell us your background, and then let us know everything you know about the trust. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so Brian should go first. <laughs> All right, Michael. So I'm Brian Pine, and I uh, serve Ward 3 on the City Council. Um, my knowledge about the trust fund is based on the fact that for 17 years, I was the trust fund uh, manager at CEDO, and uh, prior to that, was part of the group of activists that led to the creation and the ballot question that went to the voters in 1989. Me too. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we so have Brian, that piece of background. Right up? right up there. You bet. <laughs> so, um, what I thought I'd do is briefly try and explain what this question facing the voters is and what it accomplishes. And then Michael, I thought, could talk specifically about what types of uses, what, how it gets used in the community, because it's uh, a critical source. So I thought I would just explain that uh, in 1989, the voters of Burlington, not overwhelmingly, but by enough of a margin to call it a victory, approved a penny. It was literally, it was the picture on the poster was the penny and it was a penny for housing was the campaign. Um, 
And uh, this was after a few years of federal retrenchment under an administration that went from Reagan to Bush, where they did not continue to put federal funding at the level that had historically been put into affordable housing, both public housing, which is, was actually discontinued um, under Ronald Reagan entirely. So there has been no new public housing built since then. Um, so everything changed, and we needed to find some resources um, in addition to shrinking federal resources, there were some other new funding sources coming about at the state level through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund, which was a pioneering way. Uh, but it never was quite enough, but it also never really provided this early, what we called kind of risk capital that a city could put forward to a affordable housing developer to allow them to buy a piece of property to hire the engineers and the architects before even knowing for sure uh, that they could develop 10, 20, 30 housing units there, 30 homes. Um, so the, the taxpayers approved the penny. The problem with the way the uh, ordinance was created, it wasn't a charter change. The city council created an ordinance. Um, and in doing so, didn't lock in that yield from the amount that we were charging ourselves, the taxpayers, the uh, yield on that amount uh, shrunk essentially in relation to the tax base. It had to stay revenue neutral. So without going into the detail and the minutia of it, over time, the trust fund has not grown um, a whole lot since it was created in 89. There were, I'll give the mayor full credit for this because under his administration, the trust fund has seen increases, but not due to the tax assessment that was um, was placed in effect in 1989. That has decreased in value and in yield to the trust fund. So we've seen it go down. It hasn't kept up with a penny. It's about worth half a penny right now. And um, the mayor's budget has, for at least four or five years, has increased it to the value of what it would be at a full penny. So we've been essentially making up for that difference through general fund revenue. I think it's probably fair to say. What we'd like to do in this proposal, what, what's proposed now is to lock it in at the penny today and have it keep up with growth in the grand list so that it will, the yield will increase as value, property value increases with that. So I think we're estimating it will generate um, roughly 400,000, I think, in year one. Uh, could be a little bit more because there's some other added sources that may be paying into the trust fund, which we can't go into tonight. But that's a significant shot in the uh, in the arm for local affordable housing, which lets me hand the mic to hand the mic to Michael. Thank you. So um, I work. I'm Michael Monti. I'm Chief Operating Financial Officer of Champlain Housing Trust, and we work regionally. And what I would say is that the Housing Trust Fund example in Burlington has inspired other communities to establish housing trust funds. So right now, Williston's on the verge of doing one. The City of South Burlington has done one and is actually trying to increase its funds. And other communities like Winooski, I think, are beginning to look at it. So it's a good thing. Truth is, we don't have enough local funds going into affordable housing. We have state funds uh, that does that. And the city has some limitations. It can use its CDBG funds, but the state of Vermont actually has large amounts of CDBG funds. And so when we develop affordable housing around Burlington, we can go to the state and get a half a million dollars. Well, the city doesn't have that money other than the housing trust fund. It really makes the difference. And we've, we're not the only users. Uh, Cots is a user, uh, Cathedral Square is a user, quite a few others uh, have been users. Dismas House, I think, used it in the last couple of years. Home Share, so a few other programs, I think they, they might have gotten some funds to do the um, ADUs uh, work. Is that true? Out of the Housing Trust Fund? Uh, no, no, that was VH, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. So, uh, lots of good work has happened, lots of good development has happened as a result of this work. Um, in the last two years, the Housing Trust Fund distributed about a million dollars, plus or minus, and that leveraged about $42 million, $41 million in other sources. And uh, really, really coming in early, often enough, we, a good example is Bright Street Co-op, one of the last few lighted areas uh, in the old North End. Uh, a couple of buildings were for sale. The developer was prepared to uh, sell it to us, or an owner was prepared to sell it to us, a trust was prepared to sell it to us. We didn't have enough money to sort of operate it at a loss while we redeveloped the property. 
trust fund came in, gave us $50,000, enabled us for over a couple few years to really get all the money we could do, uh, get to redevelop the site and create 40 apartments uh, with the Bright Street Co-op. And that's a really great example of early money in, early risk, and great opportunity and great results. Um, but also big projects. So if you went out through out on North Avenue and you saw the 76 apartments, which we just leased up out of Cambrian uh, Rise, uh, we call it Laurentide. Um, those fully leased a range of a range of uh, incomes in that house in that building, ranging from people with practically no money to people making seventy or eighty thousand a year. But the trust fund was a, a good example of money coming in over two or three year period, giving us a, I think about three or four hundred thousand dollars. They did the same. Uh, the trust fund did the same for the Juniper House, which is owned by Cathedral Square. So two major affordable housing initiatives in Burlington um, were reliant, really, fully on the Housing Trust Fund as one of the important sources of funds that it got other than the other kinds of money that we go and get on a regular basis. So um, I think you should support it. <laughs> so, Michael, I have a question. Is the wording such that if you support the ballot idea, you would vote yes? I don't know wording. I just know how to use the money. Yeah. Vote yes. Vote <laughs> yes. Okay. On number, I'm not sure which. Okay. Do we have a sample ballot yet? Probably not. So I don't think we have that number. Okay. We're all, the mayor might know which number it is. But. Public safety taxes to housing trust fund three. The charter changes. I'm going to speak to in a moment. Are four. Matthias, I saw a hand. Yeah, you. Um, said it wasn't made as a charter change at the time it was passed as an ordinance. Is this question asking whether it should become a charter change or is it going to remain an ordinance? No, it would be it would be in our charter, which requires that we go to the state legislature to get approval. Okay. So this this wouldn't be the last word on it. We're approving it, uh, that the city um, goes to the, the state. That's correct. It would have to go through the legislature to, to become uh, in effect and it would be for the following fiscal year, so it's not likely that we'd and, be active. And is upon. it a two part that asks, in the meantime, also allow us to bring this back up to a penny as an ordinance? Uh, no, it doesn't do ask, doesn't ask both questions. Uh, okay. So, but we accomplish that because, uh, like I said, the mayor's budget has achieved that. Okay. But it's really a um, we want to lock it in. We want to lock in that commitment. Okay. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I didn't mention that. Since the trust fund was created, uh, approved in 89, enacted, went into effect in 1990, over 1,800 housing units either have been created or preserved with that little, it's a fairly small contribution when you think of it. So for every dollar, we leverage 40 other dollars. So the, the leverage factor is significant there. And, and yet it's that but for money too because it's usually that critical money that needs to be placed into a project before anybody else believes in it or has confidence that it's going to go forward. Brian, what is the per square foot cost of the affordable units in Cambria and Rise, please? Uh, total development costs or construction? No, if I go there and I'm a renter who is under opportuned, what would I pay per square foot for a oh, unit? Oh, gee, I don't think we calculated it that way, but I would say that um, I could do it in my head if it was just maybe early in the day. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe you could give me the co total cost. I can tell you the, the total area cost. So the if, you, if you, we have uh, some uh, apartments that are available and you only pay 30% of your income. And then we have some people coming in who, with vouchers who automatically get that. And then it ranges and there's, a, there's like five different Income source, so it goes from 30% to 50% to 60%, 80%, and even a little higher. So a wide range of incomes coming in, and you wind up paying 30% of your income, or shifting up to, I think the median is something like $1,000 for a two-bedroom, including utilities. Thank you. Which is a pretty decent price from a market perspective. And again, if you are lower income, there's usually a couple of units that are cheaper than that, as well as then we work with you on getting a subsidy uh, to help with your income. So, and then I think about 50, we've made a, we've made an effort over the years now, but also for this property, we brought forth 15 people who are homeless into this property immediately and they were just right off 
right out of the woods, um, or right out of a shelter into into uh, Lawrence Heights. So, uh, pretty good, pretty good stories going on uh, at, that, at that 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 building. How's how's that going with the folks? Because you know, there's this with homeless folks. There's this constant debate about you got to get them into treatment or you got to get them into yeah. housing. I've always kind of thought you have to do housing first. Is that bearing out? So, um, so we think of housing as sort of a continuum. Right down here, let's say you're homeless and you're in the woods, you're, you're going to need um, uh, you're going to need both a supply, a unit, you're going to need subsidy because you don't have any money, and you're going to need services. Okay. And if you don't, if you you can't do you can't do it without supply, but often enough, if you're very if you're homeless and you're homeless chronically, you're going to need services and you're going to need money to help you pay your rent, no doubt. And then it moves up, just like anything else. Some people who are homeless are economically homeless. They're going to be able to sort of come in with maybe a little bit of services, maybe a, a little bit of, of subsidy, but they're going to be able to sort of live on their own. So it really ranges right up through that whole process. We have hired, um, uh, last year we hired a social worker, this year we hired an additional social worker to sort of help us. Now, as we are, we now um, have 350 of our apartments with people who are formerly homeless. Uh, about 17 or 18 percent of our apartments are now people who were homeless. And so we're, we're finding that we're, we want to make sure that people stay. And the only way people are going to stay, I think, I think housing first is good. We'd like to say housing first and, and then services really quickly. <laughs> you know, because you really, people really need that support, especially if they've been, um, you know, not, not living sort of a regular life in a home, you know, with a regular apartment, knowing how to do it. When we do chronically homeless on people, they sleep outside their door uh, because they're not used to being inside. There's a whole range of stories that we have, but we've been sort of increasing the amount of folks we have who can provide social work uh, to make sure that after we house them, we retain, they retain our housing. And we don't evict them because they don't know how to behave or because they can't figure out how to pay the rent or for whatever reason. So we're really, really leaning into that quite a bit. Good question, great question, thank you. I just wanna say we have five minutes left, so. I, I'm a physician and I do, uh, addiction treatment at Central Vermont, and I see <coughs> patients for Pathways Vermont, which is a mental health agency that is based on the Housing First model. And I can't speak for Burlington, but I can tell you that um, you need both treatment and housing, and you need housing that is in a safe environment and away, particularly with addiction, away from other people. In Pathways, they, they're great at providing housing, but it's, it's, you know, they can't afford much, and so even if they are trying to get through their addiction, they are surrounded by other people who are using it. And, and so if they have housing that isn't safe, it's not going to work. And the people who have the most success are the people who manage to find housing either outside of town uh, or in, in an environment where they are surrounded by people who are, are not going to endanger them or trigger them to continue their addiction. Anything that, you know, any money that can be put towards creating safe and sober housing. Yeah, so we're, about, we're about to build um, 32 beds and 12, and 12 units. It's actually an existing building working with Vermont uh, Foundations, excuse me, Foundations for, uh, for Recovery, a group that does this now. And we're doing that out at the fort. It's going to be in Essex. Um, and it's going to bring some folks from Burlington out there. It's going to be Kind of like what you're saying, not quite in the middle of everything, a little bit far away, but still enough, close enough to services and a bus line and everything else, and a, a, an intentional community of folks who are trying to deal with recovery. So we do a lot of special purpose housing, but and I think the trust fund has supported those kinds of things. Dismiss House is one of those. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I love the sound of what you're doing. What was that 17 percent figure? I didn't quite understand that. 17 percent homeless. Uh, I think it might be 18%. It might be 18%. Um, 18% of what? 18% uh, of all of our apartments uh, have folks who are formerly homeless. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 Have we covered it sufficiently? I think you've done a great right. job. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael and Brian, for making the trek in this weather and informing us. So here we have the mayor and fire chief to talk about the remaining ballot items. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <coughs>
to see so many out, people out on a, on a slick night. And uh, happy to be with you. Be back, be back here. Um, uh, Chief Locke is here. If there are uh, technical questions about um, the public safety tax, which is really the I think one of the the main thing the main thing I want to talk about. Um, and, but let me try to boil it down. Um, and, and actually, before I go to the public safety tax, let me just make sure it's clear. I'm a big supporter of what Michael and uh, Brian were just talking about. Um, uh, we see the housing trust fund as a key tool for the city. Um, in addition to the examples Michael gave, one of the things that uh, we were, we've been able to use the housing trust fund for in recent years, people may remember when the Farrington's mobile home park um, was uh, being sold out on North Avenue a few years ago. Um, the residents of that mobile home park mobilized to try to take control of their future, uh, purchase the park from the Farringtons, and the city was able to move quite quickly with some funds from this uh, trust fund. And it was a very small part of the overall transaction, but as Michael mentioned, it was a critical, early, flexible piece of money that um, <coughs> played a significant role in the residents being able to, to take that action. And if you go there now, it's really quite um, an optimistic, positive Burlington story of recent years. The residents are do own it. They have reinvested in the community. It's in much better shape than it's been in years. Um, new energy efficient homes have, have been brought in. It is a, a, a pretty good bet that there will be permanently affordable, not by regulation, but by the nature of the housing. These will be very affordable by Burlington standards homes for, for many years to come. So this was one of the key strategies that came out of the two housing summits that um, we led down at City Hall in 2019. And I, I am hoping the voters will, uh, will give us strong support on town meeting day. We also are coming forward for a um, the first increase in the public safety tax since 2005, I believe. Public safety tax is one of the, there are actually a number of these, we can't sometimes refer to them as splinter taxes. Uh, you don't see them this way in your tax bill, but your municipal tax bill is made up of seven or eight different taxes. And um, one of them is the public safety tax. We are, what this boils down to fundamentally, and it's a little bit more complicated than this as things always are in city, city government, but if you are happy with the level of emergency services, ambulance services that the city provides, um, uh, we are at a point where we need to make a new investment to continue that level of service, and that's what this increase would allow us to do. We have two ambulances currently. They are busier every year. Uh, it has been a consistent trend for a couple decades now that basically every year the number of emergency services called to the ambulances go up. It's a combination of demographic changes, changes in the way people use this service, um, <clears throat> some population growth. The, um, we have gotten to the point now with the two ambulances we have where they are both basically as busy as the one ambulance was back about 20 years ago when we went from one to two. So we have been, you may have seen news stories uh, on this in, in past years. We, we've been, uh, we have, we, the head of the Firefighters Association, uh, Kyle, is, is here. This is something we've been talking with the firefighters for years, talking with the chief about. Um, we feel we have delayed this basically as long as we can um, and continue to reliably provide the level of ambulance services that we, we do today, which generally I think Burlingtonians are happy with, which is why we are, uh, we are coming forward with this. We think we need to take action if we're going to continue that, that level of service. That's why we're doing it. The, um, the uh, downside of this is that it, there, is, there is real cost to this, of course, and it's not, it's not the, really the cost of the ambulance itself. It is the cost of having to staff an ambulance three shifts of two, uh, two firefighters um, in each shift. Plus, uh, we have found that if you don't hire additional people for, the, people go out on leave, they go out on, uh, they have vacation days. If you just hire the six, we would uh, be spending an enormous amount in overtime to keep those shifts full. So this will essentially result in an addition of nine firefighters um, if, this, if the, this goes forward. Here's, so that's the kind of bad news on the cost. To put this decision in context, um, I I'm asking people to, to take a, a little bit wider, wider view of this. We 
um, we are very conscious that Burlingtonians pay high property taxes, and we, it has been a real priority for nine, you know, this is the ninth budget I've been responsible for. I can't quite believe that, but uh, looking out over the course of all nine budgets, this is the largest uh, <clears throat> uh, increase that I've brought to you, and uh, because we have been very conscious of costs throughout this period and conscious of rising property taxes, if you look out over that nine-year stretch, and I know it may not feel this way, but if you look at the, the city's operating taxes um, over that nine-year period, they have risen considerably slower than the rate of inflation. We are well below, if you just took the, if we had just ramped it up each year, the, 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 the taxes, the property taxes we use to provide services to the, to, to the city, if you just ramp that up by inflation each year, we'd be at a much higher rate than we are currently. If this passes, and it is a 3.5% increase, you can, if you vote yes on this, look at your municipal property tax bill, you can count on the municipal piece of it going up by 3.5% uh, as a result of a yes vote on this. Even with that 3.5% increase in this year, over that nine-year period of time, we are below the rate of inflation, which... Um, uh, I, I think is an accomplishment um, uh, when you also consider that it would not just be this expansion of services. There have been many other service expansions in, that have been made during that time, and yet we've been able to, to, to keep the impact on property taxpayers um, under control. I think I'll, I'll leave it there and open up for questions. Um, uh, cause I, uh, in, uh, be interested to hear what you know. It's my first time I've been to an MBA uh, and talked about this since we've gone forward with. This is the first, and uh, uh, interested to hear what people's questions are. Alex. Hi. Uh, well, I just want to mention, without doing any endorsement or recommendation, as a member of the wards two and three MBA steering committee, uh, one thing that was outlined for us was that trouble doesn't know the difference between rewards and this these new services will be able to serve the northern stretch of the old north end and and include that in their service so it's not like a lopped off just for the new north end thing i just wanted to mention that yeah great point Alex. i, I, I uh, yeah I, the way this ambulance will this third ambulance will be housed in the new north end which is where that kind of uh, point is is coming from the two that we have currently, one is at Central Station and one is at Station 2, which is on the southern part of North Avenue. This one will be on the northern part of North Avenue. But um, I, I, I think the way to think of this is by um, giving the city more capacity, you ensure the ser service will be faster and more consistent throughout the city, um, uh, even though this, you know, it will have an impact city life. So, hi. Um, I've been uh, living next door for since 2002. My taxes were considerably lower. I, I, I think it was 2004 maybe. We went through a reassessment and my taxes doubled. And um, I don't know, we're paying close to $11,000 for this gorgeous raised branch. I'm <laughs> just kidding. It's not a great house, but we're paying yeah. a lot. We just heard about a 7.36% increase in school taxes. We haven't broken ground on the new high school, so I'm assuming there's more costs coming down the way. And now, of course, all everything sounds great, but it's just so expensive. I mean, we're looking at now, like, if we vote yes on everything, 11% taxes in, or property taxes plus, it's like a big question mark. It's with, not additive anyway. Oh, it's not additive? No, it's, it's, that's good to know. yeah, it, I think that's a helpful clarification. So this, this one we're talking about the public safety tax, that would be three and a half percent on the municipal piece of your taxes, which is about 30% of your total tax bill. The, um, the, the school side, the projection is this, which is a frustrating thing with the school size. You never really quite know, even until later in the process, exactly where it's going to land and may, so many years it's ended up lower than the projections, but it's uh, projected as seven, seven, so it's, you have to, the blended rate, I'm not sure what it would yeah. be exactly. Yeah. Somewhere between three and, and seven. And the, when the assessment happens, is, when is that happening? And when will that increase? Yeah. I assume that there's gonna be an increase associated with that. Too. Well, so let's talk about that. So first of all, it will not hit on this coming year's tax bill. So it is, the reassessment will, will your first bill under the, reassessed taxes will be for FY22, which means you'll get the first bill in July of 21. Um, and um, 
you are absolutely right to have questions and uncertainty about what that will mean for your taxes. What surprises some people is um, the, the cumulative impact of a reassessment is that the city collects no more money. It's actually, it's a revenue neutral tax assessment. That doesn't mean that people's bills don't change. What, what ends up happening is if, if certain types of properties, if certain neighborhoods, if, um, if the residential uh, sector has appreciated faster than the commercial sector, then the total um, <clears throat> costs of the taxes get reallocated and can see a certain sector shift upwards and others shift down. Also, properties that um, uh, you know uh, haven't been it maybe for our if currently the assessment is based on a very old um, sale or transaction that's what the city's assessment is based on and then something has happened in the interim those can see it see a big jump but the, the some people actually see their taxes go down right I don't want to make this about me at all but last time I bought my house for two hundred thousand dollars and it was reassessed for four hundred thousand dollars two years later yeah you know and then you had a deal yeah, and then the economy crashed two years after that, you know, and so it's it's an expensive place to live. It's lovely, but I'm assuming now we have lost the center of Burlington, so we have the tax burden is going to be higher. Let's talk about that, too. Let's oh, talk about right. that, too. That, that, um, <coughs> no, <laughs> that, is, that is not uh, the, the correct. Uh, They're not I, paying taxes now, though. Um, they are paying taxes. They are paying um a the the so you're talking about the the city place yeah. so they were they have been since the mall was built basically the largest one of the two largest property taxpayers in the in the city um when they um uh w when they took the property down they are paying um about 25 percent less than they were paying before they are paying, their property tax payment though, interestingly, all goes into the tax increment financing district. It goes into this, this um, it is basically does not, their, their property taxes don't, don't fund city operations until the TIF district expires. I know it gets very wonky, but the, the point is there's been zero impact on the general fund from the modest decrease in taxes that they are, are paying during this period, point number one. Point number two is they're coming back to the city for a, they missed all their deadlines, right? And and the, we, uh, they they have not performed under the agreement we have with them, and they are coming back for a, an amendment to that agreement so they can get going again now with this revised project. And um, I intend to to hold them to the point that you know we had agreed to let them go forward. They made a promise of continuous construction. Um, they have not met that that commitment of continuous construction. They paid the city about a half a million dollars in costs by failing, failing to meet, to failing to perform, failing to do what they uh, committed to do. They've been paying all of our legal fees, all of our development consultant fees through the last two years that we have, the money we've had to pay because of their failure. Um, the, I am looking to them to make us whole for the impact on the TIF district as well. Uh, that the delays have caused. We actually sat down and negot started negotiating that uh, yesterday, and you know we don't. Uh, um, uh, was good. They had the right reaction to uh, me raising this. So, um, and you know, there's also this notion out there that the loss of those shops must mean that we've had a huge hit on this, on, on our other taxes, sales taxes, gross receipts. That too is not not the case. We're actually. I'm, I'm looking forward for the fourth quarter of. Uh, gross receipts taxes to come out because what it looked like to the first three quarters is the, the greatest, um, the, the highest, inc the, the highest amount of gross receipts tax taxes that we have ever received, I believe was in 2019. We'll know that for sure when the fourth quarter is out. Um, the city has, is very healthy and very strong despite the fact that we're going through this transition. And um, so that is not, uh, there's, your property taxes are too high. You're absolutely right about that. Um, it's shocking to talk to friends in other parts of the country and compare property taxes. Um, there's some big structural reasons for that are challenging. Um, I have, the part of that that I can that I have the most control over is the municipal side, which again is about 30% of the, the bill you get. And we, um, I really think have been quite disciplined um, uh, about that. and. I think that's what you want me to do. I don't think you want me to come forward and never, you know, it's, if we don't ever ask for property tax increases, 
um, we will not be able to maintain the level of services we have. Uh, the, it just doesn't work that way. And it's, this is another point that a lot of people um, you know, wouldn't intuitively know is other levels of government, state government, federal government, the main revenues are, are taxes that rise consistently with inflation. You know, if you think about it, your sales taxes uh, go up because the cost of goods generally, you know, rises over time. That's yeah, that's the whole concept of inflation. The the um, income. Uh, let's finish. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, I will wrap this up. The in income taxes. Incomes generally rise over time, and the state and federal governments they their their revenues go up with those increases. Property taxes. Um, we only see an increase in the property tax revenues when we come to you with an item like this and you approve it or when there is real growth, real investment in, in the city. When someone goes from having a parking lot to having a building on it, that's when we get new, new revenues. But that, that, there isn't as much as that as people think either. Um, let me just make sure if I'm about to lose the floor here, I wanna just very briefly touch on the other item which is should not be controversial should help us solve a problem. People may remember a few times in recent elections when something very confusing has happened. Maybe you've been caught up with it. You may have requested your ballot by mail and you got a ballot and you filled it out and you sent it back in and then you got another ballot from the city. What is going on there, what has happened there is we have had up until now different deadlines for the state and federal elections versus the local elections. And that has created this kind of perverse situation where by law we've had to send out the state and federal ballots earlier than the local ballot has been ready. Uh, then we've been allowed to print the local ballot by, by statute. We're trying to fix that basically. At least we're trying to fix that for the fall elections. We're, we're harmonizing those deadlines. It does mean people have to get in their petitions and stuff uh, a couple weeks earlier. Um, but it, but it, it addresses that issue. Once every four years, like a year like this, when we have a presidential election, we may still have a conflict in the town meeting day elections, but this will make things much better and, and eliminate some of those problems. Thank you very much, Mayor, for coming here tonight and clarifying those ballot items for us. Thank you. Our two city councilors are here. Karen Paul has generously donated her time on this agenda to the mayor to make sure that he could talk about these items. But we brought Joan all the way from the south end of the South District, so she's going to get a few minutes to tell us about what's happening on council issues. Thank you. I, I think I'm actually the west end of the South District. But, um, so there was a, a few things to talk about. Um, Staying on the on the tax theme, um, I've been trying to kind of figure out. I, I just want people to be aware that we are going through reassessment. Um, I contacted our assessor to kind of try and get an idea of how this part of town is going to be affected by reassessment. Um, the reassessment is we're supposed to have a new assessment by April first, twenty twenty one. So just a little more than a year away. And then we will have a bill refle reflecting that um, reassessment in July 2021. Um, so the average differential between um, our property values and market value, we're supposed to be at market value, so that's what's called the CLA for the education tax purposes, is about 72%. I think the last time they reported was 75%, but we continue, our real estate prices continue to go up, so we continue to increase that differential. So he says it's about 72%. Um, and in the, I had him do a calculation for not just Ward 6, but basically south of Main Street. And he said that um, the average difference, or not the average, most of the, properties that have sold have been between 50 and 80% of market value. So if you're at 80% of market value, you would actually, in theory, see a tax decrease. If you're at 50%, you're going to see a tax increase. Um, and in addition to that, we do have, uh, according to the assessor, 7.12 cents that is not revenue neutral. So there are a few taxes that are not revenue neutral, including the housing trust fund tax that we're um, voting on. 
uh, an average house in this part of town is the market value is about four hundred and sixty thousand dollars so it's not it would be assessed at roughly 72 percent of that um but that's so one cent tax will be forty six dollars on a four hundred and sixty thousand dollar assessment um, most of our assessments right now would be less than that but you can also look up you know your assessment is on your tax bill and on um on the city website as well uh, I also wanted to talk about Burlington Telecom because we are um, we are now at the point where we get to decide if we're going to have a carried interest in Burlington Telecom. And I did put that out on Front Porch Forum and um, invited you to give me feedback. And I've, I've gotten some, not a whole lot. But I think that there are three elements that, you know, that should be considered in making the decision. The first is that the reinvestment um, that we're talking about is $2.4 million, which gets us a 7.5% interest um, in the company, and it gets us one seat on the board. And um, the board is seven people, right? Is that? So the question I'm asking myself is, is this the best use for $2.4 million of city money is this as an investment um is this a reason is there a reasonable exp expectation that we're going to really increase the value of that investment over time there's some people think we'll get our 17 million dollars back by reinvesting this 2.4 million uh, i am more skeptical than that i don't think we're getting 17 million back and i'm not really sure how good an investment is, but perhaps there are people in this room that are better judges of that than I am, so give me your feedback. And then in terms of the influence, we would have one seat on the board. Um, I don't have a lot of clarity on how that seat is appointed yet, and I don't think we've, we haven't really had those discussions, but this is a private company, so those board discussions are private. Um, and the other members of that board would be um, the local manager and a lot of people from the parent company um, who are currently on the board. Uh, are you cutting me off already? No, we had five minutes left. I hate Did, to tell you. Oh, okay. It's 8.30. Okay. Sorry. So, so do the, no questions tonight? Yeah. So if you would like... Sure. If you would like to ask Joan questions, I bet that she would stand back there in the room and answer any questions that you have. I'm sorry, Joan, to cut you off. Well, did you pitch the Ward 6 clerk yet? Did I ask yes, you? Amy Bovee, and you would not believe the response. Everyone in this room raised their hand. <laughs> yes, look at this. Amazing. Everyone here is working at the polls on March 3rd. It's amazing. So, yeah, before we end this evening, I just want to acknowledge Karen Paul for a couple things. One, that she worked very hard to get our representatives from BT here, as well as Vermont Gas. That didn't quite pan out how we had hoped. But um, thank you, Karen, for all your efforts and also for leafleting your streets in, uh, streets in this neighborhood, in this ward, to make sure that folks affected by the BT non-service status were aware of this meeting. Also, Karen... Uh, is up for re-election, so she has um, waged a campaign against um, actually no one. But <laughs> if you'd like to know more about what she's got on her mind in terms of the council and the city, uh, sh there's a blue newsletter uh, at the back of the room that you could pick up. So I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Andy, Anna, the music was amazing. Thank you all <laughs> for participating. And, um, you know, we have all this food that was made by the Burlington Food Project, which works with the youth and local food producers to create healthy meals for students and for people in the community who use their catering services, which we did this evening. So if you want to take some food home, grab a plate, pile it up, take this food home so we don't have to deal with it. All right. Thank you all.